basically one for each pivot. Let's see if it, if this gets if, it, if this can start, I can show you that. But um, and also I was I was uh, I made a link on the code sample code, so I'll, I'll put it out here. Put it up here. Um, in MATLAB to um, kind of show some some of the things. So one of these is the syntax we already talked about, about that uh, lean prog prog command with the option um, enabling simplex method or disab you know enabling the other method, the other algorithm. Okay, uh, so this is the two things from last time. Um, now, there was a question that I got on the problem number eight that I assigned. And um, looking more carefully, it, it seems like that they, uh, the book is missing the constraints, the pot, that the variable should be positive or zero. Um, because if you, don't, if you don't set that constraint, then what, what, what's going to happen? You have two constraints, right? Two equality constraints. So just think about it in 3D. You're going to have two planes. Those are two planes that are not parallel, right? I mean, you've probably. So they're intersecting. So the combination of the two constra equality constraints makes it a line in 3D, right? And let's say we don't have any constraints on x being positive or anything. Then you just have a line, infinite line. And you're, minimi you're maximizing, or I think, minimizing the sum of the. Basically, you're minimizing a linear function over an entire line. No, you don't have a maximum or a minimum, right? So I think um, that would be the end of it if you don't have x1 or x and x2 and x3 being positive. So I'd like you to. Um, um, if you if you looked at the problem, reconsider that with the positive x1, x2, x3. Um, but let's say if you kind of implicitly assume that, and you should never impl you should never assume a constraint if it's not there and if it's not coming from a realistic problem. Okay. But in this case, if you don't, assume, I mean, not assuming that leads you to a very quick answer. Okay, you have negative infinity is a minimization is a minimum. Um, assuming it actually introduces some more um, considerations. So let, let's let's go over those. Just want to open. I'm going to turn it off. I know, but I don't want to comment again. Um, okay, so anyway, this is what I was talking about the general simplex tableau applet. It allows you to input pretty much any, well, I haven't tried a lot of them, but uh, the example they have here, here is has four variables with two, three constraints. <coughs> When you when you solve when you hit solve, actually, it's going to show you all the tableaus that it went through to get to the um, to the final answer. Okay, so that's just it's actually uh, the the app that I was looking for, and I just didn't look for uh, long enough in this website. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, Okay, so that will save you a lot of uh, raw operations. I mean, uh, raw, raw elementary operations. Um, it's still important that you can interpret, you know, for going from one tableau to, to the next one. And um, 
Each tableau is basically indicates where the basic variables are at that particular vertex, right? Each tableau corresponds to a vertex, um, which are the non-basic variables. And um, what else does it tell you? It tells you the max, the value of the of the functional of the cost functional function, and um, so it's it's quite it's. It, it's pretty. It's telling everything pretty much. Um, today we're going to learn learn about the dual problem, which um, can be used sometimes to kind of um, solve this kind of problems in an easier fashion, depend, depending on the problem, of course. So let me minimize this for now. Um, well, let me, let me go also back show you that um, code you probably have seen already um, so okay you can open or save uh, let, let's 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 just open it oh, what was that okay it opened it in actually Mathematica it's interesting it's just a text file with a uh, extension M um, so the problem is a linear programming problem, kind of a, talking about a, a family farm. Um, there are three crops that are trying to be that are, that are to be planted on on a specific uh, land that has 625 acres available, and the um, let's see. The restrictions are um, irrigation required. So each type of crop, each each acre of of each crop uh, requires a certain amount of water, and there is this maximum amount of water. So it's an inequality constraint. And then there's the labor required for each acre of each type of crop, and so forth. Um, and finally, I think there is this total acreage. Okay. Now, let me do the following. I'm going to, I hope I can just select the whole thing. So just a, a text file. And I'm going to copy it and open it in, in MATLAB. And where's my file? Here. Okay. And if you've never worked with files, dot m files in MATLAB, here's what you do: is you just open an editor, and you type your, you know, um, your kind of commands or program that you want to run all at once. So what I did, I just kind of um, copied and pasted that text so you don't have to do uh, much about it and then what you do is just save um, the file it has to have extension M okay once it's saved you can run it okay and I have this font fairly big so it's taking most of my uh, Oh, this is what happens when I copy and paste and I have this big fonts. I think it's kind of wrapping the lines uh, around. So let me do an alternate here. Let me just, when I click on this, I'm going to save it instead of opening it. Okay, so. Okay. Close and I'm gonna open this. Sorry. Huh? Hmm? 
No, I think that's, is it? Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, all right, so now it looks like it's, so cut and pasting is, you know, has some drawbacks uh, if you use big fonts like this. Um, in any event, it kind of did the work. You can kind of dock this. You can see several uh, windows at the same time. And I think you can actually make it do it like this. So um, the output kind of starts with the um, message that optimization has been terminated. It gives you the optimal um, you know the decisions that you have to make on each acres, acre, acreage. Um, notice that they're not integer. We're going to talk about later today. What do you do if you really want, you know, an integer number like a, a round number of of, of acres? Um, this would be the m maximum yield, I believe. That was a maximization problem. Um, and let's see. Let's, let me open the code again. Yeah, so the total yield is to be maximized. Um, so just running really quickly here through the uh, setup, you have the right hand, so you have the uh, cost function, you have the metrics of the uh, coefficients of the constraints, and you have the right hand side, and this is a column vector. And I think the first thing is to use um, the large scale method. So by default, we don't we don't specify the simplex method as the algorithm. So uh, we just apply the lintprog command to negative f. Remember that's for the standard is to minimize. So it's negative f, a and b. That's all. Um, let's see. I I believe we should have put also the. Lower bounds, no? We should have lower bounds. So, let's see. Is there, is there a um, kind of a. If you don't put the lower bounds and you get a positive optimum. Is that going to be enough to conclude that you know this is or should we have lower bounds? What do you think? I believe that if you have the if the optimal is achieved at a point where um, Positive, basically all all of the, all of the three components are positive. Then what you've done here is you've done an optimization over a larger set, right? So uh, certainly over a smaller set, which would be where when they you know you restrict the lower bounds to be zero, then the maximum would still be achieved there or minimum, right? So unless it's um, you get a negative numbers at least one negative component in this optimization, then you have to go back and introduce the lower bounds. Okay. Now, um, because we have inequality constraints, also at the end of the optimization you want to ask, you know, what were the slack variables and how do you compute for this optimal number, uh, for the optimal solution, how do you compute the slack variables? Well, slack variables is simply the right hand side of the inequality constraints minus a times the optimal x. And notice that I've, I've actually extracted x um, as well as the, well, as, as well as other things, but x was one of the outputs. So that ends up being <coughs> um, this three columns, I mean column of three, uh, three uh, a vector of, of three components, a column vector. Now, what does it mean that the slack is zero on the first and third component? 
Remember, those are inequality constraints. So slack zero means there is no slack between the left side and the right side of the, of the constraint. So it means that it's an equality. It's a binding constraint. And not the second one. right? So if here I think we're in 3D, so we can think of the planes that intersect and form that simplex, right? In the actual 3D, in the in the physical in the physical space. Um, so binding constraints are a constraint where the slack, uh, a constraint where where uh, the inequality is is actually an equality, represents what? It's basically a vertex that that sits on the actual plane, right? And so is the third. So you have the first plane and the third plane, but not the second plane. So what that means is, second plane is is really not. I mean that vertex is not on the second plane. Okay. Now the other thing that that we'll see in a second is um, when you don't have a binding constraint here. So when you don't have a slack that is zero. That basically means that that constraint is not relevant. In other words, it's not essential for setting that for set, for for reaching that that optimal that maximum. Meaning that you could relax that constraint, not by much, but if you relax it by a little bit. So the second constraint was what labor. So you could say, well, if we allow. If we say now we have available a little bit more labor, that would still give you the same optimal, same same vertex. Actually, no, I'm sorry, not the same vertex, but the same optimal. Okay. Now, that's the significance of a shadow price. I don't know how many of you have, I mean, unless you're an economist, you're probably not very familiar with shadow prices. Shadow price is actually, just look at the second component here. Shadow price is basically saying how much, by how much would the optimal, num would the optimal cost or optimal objective function would increase if we relax that particular constraint, if we allow more units, uh, more more um, labor hours total. So if we allow, you know, one additional labor hour and redo the, that that um, uh, optimization problem, where the constraints are changed from whatever they were on the right side. Of the of the inequality constraints, to that plus one on the on this component in the labor. How much would the actual objective function change? The optimal, it won't change, right? Because because the maximum is already achieved at a point where where that particular uh, um, um, constraint was not essential, right? The vertex was not in that. Binding uh, on that um, boundary plane, if you want. So that's why you see zero. So the shadow price is zero. It's, it doesn't make any difference if you um, change the constraint, which is not binding. Okay. So if you don't have a binding constraint, then uh, the shadow price will be zero. If you do have a binding constraint, then what, what's going to happen? That means the vertex that you, the optimal vertex on the simplex, sits on that plane. So, and that plane is going to change if you change a constraint that corresponds to, right? So basically, of course, you're going to change the simplex altogether by moving one of the face up or down, right? But if you face it, if you move one binding constraint, if you change it by one unit, let's say. Then presumably you're going to get a change in the optimal. Well, you're going to get a change in the optimal solution because you have a different simplex, you have a different vertex, and you're going to get a change in the objective, um, in the optimal objective. And by how much? 
by the sh actual the, the sh that's going to be the called the shadow price. Okay. So when you do this optimization in MATLAB, you uh, you automatically get uh, this information as well as you know the x, the optimal x, the optimal um, value of the of the objective, and um, I mean slacky you just compute by that simple um, algebra and the shadow prices. Okay, and the code that way I made it. I also I think I, I um, asked to do the same thing using let's see the simplex method. So if you do if you do this other algorithm, so basically you search the optimal vertex, but through the what we've been talking about the simplex method. So we uh, set the options to be um, simplex method on whatever um, the code requires and then you just do this then what's coming what's coming out is see I mean basically same same outputs but what is coming out is actually a different Vertex. Okay, so that's what I was saying last time. Is different algorithms can can find different vertices, both being optimal in, in the sense that the objective to maximize that objective function, the cost function, is still the same. Okay, and we get the same value if you remember from the uh, first and the second method but we get different numbers uh, what was this zero it meant basically you don't use any of the third crop okay. how is that possible well geometrically uh, we said that's possible because the objective function could be kind of situated or oriented so that when it hits the simplex, it doesn't hit it on only one point, but it hits it on a, on an edge. So you don't have just two optimal; you have basically the whole line segment or this whole edge to be set of optimal solutions. Now, only the two extreme points would be real vertices, right? Uh, but you do have infinitely many solutions. So which one should you use? Which one should you, how should you do it? Um, let's look at the slack. It's still the labor hours is, is a non-binding constraint, okay, which it should be. But what do you see about the slack? <coughs> I think it's smaller than the that's 74, this is 62. So from a practical point of view, <clears throat> which, which decision would you, would you rather make? Okay. Using the simplex method or the, or the first method? You would like the slack to be more or less? So you'd like to work more is the labor. I mean, I'm, I'm just specific. This, this would mean that we have less free hours right from the available hours this would mean that if we choose to to plan those things it would take more work actually and achieve the same uh, same objective so what it means is basically on on that edge or it could be even a, a whole like two-dimensional shape of you know of or whatever on the optimal set the set of optimal solutions the large scale does what goes a step further than the simplex method and tries to minimize the slack okay maximize the slack let's say minimize sorry maximize the slack yeah Maximum slack on the other 
Um, the large scale. I, I'm not very familiar with the the in, inside of the of the large scale method, um, but I believe the answer is yes. Based because it's based on this dual problem, and there is a relation between the slack of the original variables and uh, the slack the slackness of the of the dual. But I look I look into that. That that's um it's an important thing to know. Um, also, the shadow prices, you can see that that don't change. Okay. I mean, they don't change because wherever this was binding, you know, I mean, wherever it wasn't binding, the, slack, the shadow price is zero. Okay. So I believe the maximizing the slack would be. Is there any significance on the shadow prices to the fact that it's 100 or is it just that they're non zero? Um, well, <coughs> The fact that hundred, I don't think that. Um, the fact that they're non-zero basically indicates you have the binding constraints. Okay. Now, the value of those shadow prices is going to be actually the, uh, related to the dual problem. Okay. So let's let's um, let's go and talk about those. Duality. So, um, any any questions? Well, this is just loading. Yep. You could apply simplex method on that optimization problem. And would it come out the same then? It would, it would come out the same, but you would may have a difference in the resulting slack. So if, if the cost of labor is, is what you want to minimize, then all methods should give you the same minimum. How is that achieved, though, is, it may be different from, from, from method to method. Um, Exactly. So if we had a thousand labor hours available, and the sim in the simplex we used all of those in sixty-two, we were yeah. working, where effectively that means you've got one one and a half weeks you're not working in eighty hours a week or forty hours a week. Well, yeah, depends how it's. So, so I mean, if people are just sitting there and they're paid anyway. Used, yes, but they're yeah. not used. But if you if you plan this in advance and you say, well, I'm just going to hire hourly workers then you'll hire less and you minimum and get the cost to be lower um, but it, I think you would change the actual problem from a maximization to a minimization one Okay, so just briefly about this. Um, I think it's, it's easy to count the lectures here because there are so few, right? Um, so in the in the dual with each linear programming problem, there comes comes a dual uh, formulation, and just in short, here here's. Um, so consider the LPP, and this would not be in standard form initially. So it would be um, just to minimize 
a linear function, so c times x subject to ax greater than or equal than b and x positive. So this is not in standard form because it has inequality constraints. Okay? Now, of course, this is not the only linear programming problem you can, or you can phrase it also differently, but um, let's, just, let's just start with this one. Then the dual problem, so this is called a primal. Let's call it, uh, I'm not going to give a name yet, but just the primal problem. Then the dual problem is to maximize y times b. So now y is the a uh, set of variables, a dual variables, and they're arranged in a row. Uh, let's see. So here, x was arranged in a, it was a column vector, and c was a row. So you could do this multiplication, and you got a, a scalar, and that was what you want to minimize. Here is the same, but this is, uh, it's a row. Y, the unknown, are uh, arranged in a row, and b, b is the same b as here, so it's a column. So again, this is a scalar subject to y times a less than or equal than c and y positive. So once again, you have to check the consistency of this. So y, I'm sorry, there's no way for me to move this monitor, so you just have to kind of squeeze to the right or to your left. Um, so you have a row y, so y1 through ym, right? So that's the, the, that's the size, the number of uh, rows of a. So this is y1 through ym and times the matrix. So where y is y1, y2, ym. Of course, A is M by N. Okay, and what's the outcome of this multiplication? This row with this uh, matrix. It's going to be a row that has N entries. So that's basically, term by term, you have to have this. So let's, let's give a quick example here. Let's say minimize. So find the dual or write the dual. LPP for the um, for the LPP. It says minimize five x one plus six x two subject to. Uh, let's say x1 plus 2x2 um, greater than 5 and negative x1 plus 5x2 greater than 3 4x1 plus 7x2 greater than um, Yeah, I guess less than or equal than eight, for instance, and x one and x two are positive. Let's say I believe this would be a feasible. So it's not well. Um, I believe that's a non-empty feasible set, but. One will need to check that, okay? But just just to formulate the dual problem, the only thing you have to do is uh, 
introduce how many y's? Well, one for each constraint, right? So three y's, and you maximize five y one plus three y two minus eight y three subject to you know how many constraints basically two constraints well we'll talk about that in a second equalities if you have equality constraints you would actually write it as a greater than or equal to and less than or equal to so it replaces by two uh, inequalities Okay, so this would be subject to, uh, let's see, and now the other thing to do is the constraints actually come on the columns, the, co the coefficients of the matrix A, remember you multiply a row Y times, times A, so it's going to be Y1 minus Y2 minus 4Y3, right? So again, this would. What's the coefficient on the x1 on your uh, third constraint? Hmm? Uh, subject to the third line, what's the coefficient x to x1? This one? Yeah. 4. Okay. But it would be negative if you put it in that form. So it would be minus, minus, minus. Right? And now you can see 1, negative 1, negative 4 enters in this. Um, expression less than or equal than what? C, 5, right? And the second one would be 2y1 plus 5y2 minus 7y3 less than or equal than 6. And y1, y2, y3 are positive. Okay. Now, <clears throat> why, you know, and again, we're, we're going to go to equality constraints in a second, and we're going to basically like to know what, I mean, the, the strategy would be to say, let's make every LPP, primal LPP, into standard form, and then take the dual and see how it looks. Um, But before before that, um, there's there's one little thing which which you might want to um, notice here, is that when we associate a minimization problem with an inequality constraint, we usually like to put the the greater than or equal to. Okay, so in other words, if we have less than or equal to, we replace the signs. You know, we change the sign of the inequality. The dual will have maxim maximizing a, a you know a linear function over a set where we which is described as with less than or equal to, okay, and that really has to do with the kind of the, the way the feasible set. So if you have both x and y positive, this means you're in the first quadrant or first octant or the first in you know, the positive cone. Then an inequality constraint like this will actually make it. Not always, but normally it would make it kind of a bounded region, right? So you could maximize that functional. You would get a maximum value, right? I mean, not always. You know, sometimes this feasible region is infinite, so then the maximization problem is infinite. Right? But we'll see that that case when this when the dual problem has a infinity, so it doesn't have a, a, an optimal solution corresponds to the case when the minimization has a uh, either it's infeasible or it has a minimum a negative infinity okay so that's just to keep in mind you will not really want to uh, consider a minimization problem over 
uh, inequalities that are the, the other way around. Okay. I mean, you may have those, but you always want to convert it to uh, this type of inequality so that you can write a dual. Okay? So it's sort of a canonical form, if you want. So in a canonical form. So there's canonical form of an LPP, and there's a standard form of the LPP. Yeah? Okay, so now let's see. The first question is why do we even consider this, and you know why do we switch the vector uh, cost co coefficients of the cost function with this right hand side of the of the constraints? Why do we look for the dual problem? Um, well, first of all, there is. These are two different ways of looking at the same problem, as you'll see in the, in the, in the example I have. Um, also, the book has an example, I, I believe, of uh, transportation. Um, problem. I'm going to use a different example from the book. Um, there's this network of... Um, Um, so you're welcome to read that that example of of the duality, um, but just at the first glance, you can see that that the um, there's a change in the number of constraints from the from the first from the primal to the dual or from the dual to the primal, and sometimes that that's uh, useful. I think you know the homework. Um, first problem in the homework has that that feature. So here is an example where we have three constraints and two variables, and the dual is has two constraints and three variables, right? Um, well, going this way it doesn't look too advantageous because you're going from a two-dimensional feasible set to a three-dimensional feasible set. So, um, but if you are able to go back, so if you start with this problem. Now you can see that actually, it's not hard to see that you can actually write this as a minimization problem. Basically switch the signs here, right? And basically you could rewrite this thing as, in the canonical form, we're greater than or equal to. Then you could ask the same question, what is the dual of this problem? And then you will see that it's exactly that problem. So that means that's a general um, occurrence. The dual of a dual problem is always the, the primal problem. So, if you had a problem that had three-dimensional feasible set, you know, with inequality constraints, then you could go to a problem that has fewer uh, variables. Okay, and then you could use some other method, like graphical method or something, to solve that uh, dual problem. Okay. Now, what about LPPs in standard form? Of course, you're asking the question, what if some are equalities, some are inequalities, right? How do you treat that case? So the strategy is to say, well, every linear programming problem will convert it to a standard form where we only see equality constraints. Of course, will pay the price of introducing possibly more variables, right? But in the dual formulation, that's only going to introduce more constraints, right? Remember when you convert a, a linear programming problem from um, any form to standard form, you don't really change the number of constraints. You just change those from inequality to equality by introducing slack variables. So in the dual formulation, you're going to have the same number of variables. You're just going to have more or more constraints or fewer constraints. Yeah? Okay, so in standard form, it's the minimization of CX subject to AX equals B and still X positive. Okay? 
Well, as I just said, the strategy is to convert everything in standard form before you convert to dual. But just so you kind of make a connection with what was that procedure above, um, so theoretically, uh, one can write this as set of double number of constraints where AX is greater than or equal to B and AX is less than or equal to B. Okay? So now you can, you can remember we're minimizing, we have a minimization problem, so we'd like to write everything as greater than or equal to. So we replace, if we have five constraints here, we replace by ten constraints. But again, this is only our theoretical level, so we don't do this in practice. And then I just want to come up with a, minimis, with a dual problem for that formulation, for the standard formulation. Okay? So I've got two sets. So what this means is that I can write this as um, A and negative A. and B to be as B and negative B. Now, let's think a little bit about this. Um, huh? No, 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 okay, so this is, a, this is a block, a two block. You put a block of A and you put a negative A, sorry, um, and you leave a space in between, okay? So, I like to think, like in MATLAB, how you write this. Um, I think you'd put, you either leave a space or you put a comma, I think. You don't put a, a semicolon. Now, why, why do you put them like this and not on a column? I mean, why don't you put the blocks one uh, beneath the other and you put them one next to each other? Remember, because you want to find, you want to write that x. Actually, the same x, not 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 different x. You want to write this uh, greater than or equal to? Excuse me. Means. So if you think about this, what would this mean now? It would actually mean that you take the first block of a bar. That would be a times x. So it hits the same column, right? So it's the way a matrix a multiplication occurs. If you, if you hit this by, by a column, then it would be this block times this column would be less than or equal than B, greater than or equal than B, and this block times the same X, right? So it would basically be that system that, com that uh, you know, uh, both sets of inequalities, okay? So anyway, this is, this is just a kind of a trick to, to convert an equality into inequality constraints, which is the opposite of what you'd like to do in the practice. But just to see, so, so um, the dual problem, is now is then uh, maximize y times b bar right uh, 
uh, and I, I really want to call it y bar because now I have twice the number of variables. Why? Subject to y bar a bar less than or equal than same c, right? We haven't changed that. Okay. So where y bar is y well I think it's better to not put it in the subscript because we use that so it's twice as long as is a row that's twice as long as what was initially y or it has twice the number I mean it has the same twice the number of constraints in the original problem and all you do now is you say, well, what is what is b bar? That's that's y one b. Well, let's let's just write y bar b bar is minus y two b. Well, plus minus, right? So that's so it's y one minus y two. That's a row times b column b. Okay. And I also forgot to mention y bar has to be positive in this dual problem. Okay, and finally, what is y bar a bar? Well, this is y1, y2, and this is a minus a. So let's see. Uh, let's see. This is a row, and I should have actually two columns. Twice the number of rows. So shouldn't this be, um, I think this should be, um, yeah, I think this should be, B, B bar should be a column. So you double the number of B. So this should be, this negative B should be, you know, B and then a negative B, right? And the same with A. You should have A and the negative A here, which of course would then make the multiplication of rows of A by column X possible and multiplication of negative X, negative A, columns, uh, rows of negative A times column X equal negative B. And now you can have you can you can uh, make sense of this. So you have a, a twice as long row times a and negative a. So this gives you y1 a minus y2 a. So this is y1 minus y2 a. So anyway, that's what you see here is the same vector. Let's call it y. So denoting y to be the difference of the first part of, of y bar and the second part of y bar. Of course, the first one has to be positive, the second one has to be positive, but the difference may not be positive. We obtain the dual becomes to maximize y times b subject to what? Y A less than or equal than 
C. I think less than or equal to was yeah. Less than or equal to C, but no restriction on Y. So if you start with equality constraint, all equality constraints, standard form, then the dual problem has no constraints, like y doesn't have to be positive. But the way you form that is the same, right? So can you show us one time with the same constraints on that last one? Well, just that same example we had. With the example above, exactly. Yep. Just with equality rather than. Yeah. So let me let me write it again here so we so again the primal is minimizing cx subject to ax equals b and x positive. The dual is maximizing yb subject to ya less than or equal to c. And that's why it is so important that you know, if you don't see an equality, an equality like x positive, if you don't hear about see a concern like that, you should always, you should not always assume that you know it's just a typo. Because it really makes it's a huge difference, you know, between this and and also allowing x uh, a to b. Okay, so uh, an example, write the dual uh, problem of the LPP, say minimizing 5x1 plus 6x2 subject to x1 plus 2x2 equals 5. Minus x1 plus 5x2 greater or equal than 3. 4x1 plus 7x2 um, less or equal than 8, same. And x1, x2 positive. Hold on, let me, um, what was the previous one? I just want to, yep. All of this, so I made equality in the first one, right? And of course, there's, there's the same if you make more than, um, okay, so what's the, what would be the strategy here? First, convert everything into equality constraints. I mean, into standard form. The LPP with the standard form. So first, convert to LPP in standard form. Okay. It's a primal. The primal you convert to LPP in standard form. So how do how does it work? Hmm? In standard form, we have to uh, change inequalities to equalities. So for each inequality, we introduce a slack variable. So we have two additional slack variables, right? So u1 and u2, say. So um, of course, they, they don't come in, in here, but we'd like to indicate that we have the, you know, you know, the objective function. Subject to x1 plus 2x2 equals 5 minus x1 plus 5x2 minus u1 equals 3, yeah? 4x1 plus 7x2 plus u2 equals 8. And of course, u1, u2 positive, and x1, x2 positive. Is this now standard form? Equality everywhere? 
and greater than or equal to zero. And we have two, two, uh, these two slack variables introduced. Now, the dual will have how many variables? One for each constraint. We have three constraints previously, equal inequality, we have three constraints now. So that hasn't been, hasn't increased. So it's going to be 5 y1 plus 3 y2 plus 8 y3. Yes? And of course, this is to maximize subject to how many, how many, um, Constraints will the dual problem have? Four, because there's four variables. And those are, remember you have to do it on columns now. You take those columns and put them on rows. So it's going to be y1 minus y2 plus 4 y3 less than or equal than 5. Okay. Um, okay, and we have a few more. Um, 2y1 plus 5y2 plus 7y3 less than, than 6. <clears throat> we have what else? 0 times y1 plus negative 1 times y2 plus 0 times y3 less than or equal than 0. And one more, that's 0y1 plus 0y2 plus 1y3 less than or equal than 0. And what do you notice here? And there's no constraint on, on y, I mean, a priori constraint on y's, right? But it turns out that y2 has to be positive from this, from this constraint, and y3 has to be negative from this constraint, right? And there's no on y1, no, no uh, restriction on y1. So you get a partial... Like, like in your homework. This would be exactly like in a homework. You have a maximization problem, three variables, with, three, with two inequalities, right? Two true inequalities. And only two of the variables have to be positive. Well, okay, this has to be negative. How can you make it positive? <coughs> Put negative y3, so everywhere you're going to change this into negative 4, negative 7, and negative 8. Well, so, <clears throat> I mean, you could maybe draw uh, like a rule, like if I have one equality and two inequalities in the primal problem to kind of anticipate how many constraints, you know, positive y's will you have, but I don't think that's worth it because um, that's not so essential. What is essential is that you can actually formulate the dual problem. Um, from 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 any LPP by first moving it to standard form, okay. And in fact, you can now see that this thing, which is kind of the golden rule, I would call this the golden rule, from going to a primal to a dual, also in, uh, uh, um, contains. As a sub, as a subset, this the, the original one which we said. Why? Because how would you move from this formulation to a standard form? To a standard form, you would introduce slack variables. You want through whatever how many constraints you have, right? You would change this into equality. You still have this, so that's a standard form. But now you have those many more 
slack variables. So in the dual problem, you're going to have same number of variables, but twice as many constraints. Well, this is one, and this is the other. Except these will be kind of coming out as those zeros and ones. And so, um, so it is the same process. This original one and the kind of the golden rule that we had uh, later. Okay, and let me just kind of before we take a break, um, let me just give you an example: the diet problem. Now I should say that this problem is actually listed in chapter one, so. I didn't specifically say that chapter one shouldn't be ignored because it just gives you kind of a flavor of what the type of optimization problems will be touching. But um, unfortunately, I won't have time to you know kind of go through every single one and initially. But we'll 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 kind of touch most of them. So the diet problem. Um, let me let me uh, let me uh, formulate it like this. Um, let's assume there are. There are two uh, types of food um, available. I don't know for you know for a day or for whatever for purchase. F1 and F2. Okay, and uh, three types of nutrients. N1, N2, N3. I mean, it could be sugar, salt, and I don't know. <laughs> Pepper, I don't know. Um, well, this is not nutrients, but um, caffeine, yeah. It's the basic. Um, the uh, content of each food is as follows of each type of food is as follows so it's you know many times you use a, a table let's say um, one unit of the first food is has one unit of nutrients and one two units in nutrients and two and three units of nutrients and three and for food two is one four and six I mean this are just numbers um, okay, and in, in addition to this, we have daily requirements for each nutrient type, and those would be ten, say, twenty-four, and thirty-two. So that's like the minimum necessary uh, of each type of of nutrient. Okay, and finally, the cost of uh, F1 is, let's say, 120, and cost of one unit F2 is 180. Okay? So the question is, how much, you know, the first type uh, of food, how much, how many units of the second type of, two, of food should be, you know, administered so that the daily requirements are satisfied, so there'll be inequality constraints, as well as uh, the cost is, is kept to the minimum. Okay, so the objective is. So unit cost. Hmm? Unit cost. Unit cost. Yes, unit. Objective is to minimize total cost of the diet which is 120x1 plus 180x2, where x1 is number of units of the first type of food and number of units of the second type of food, subject to the constraints that the data requirements have to be met. So what's the first one? X, for nutrient N1, this is x1 plus x2 at least 10. 
x, 2x1 plus 4x2 at least 24, and 3x1 plus 6x2 at least 32. Okay? This is a uh, primal problem in, it's a LPP problem in canonical form, right? You have to minimize this subject to inequalities like that. And of course, x, we have to say x1, x2, x3 have to be positive, right? Uh, and x1 and x2 have to be positive. Okay? So, <clears throat> just what is the dual problem? Of course, you can set it up just artificially, like we like we said, has to be set up. Um, and that would be that I have three decision variables, or three dual variables, y1, y2, y3, and <clears throat> I would have to maximize 10 y1 plus 24, y2 plus 32, y3. Okay? So, what would that mean? That would be from a, let's say, pharmaceutical company point of view. Um, let's say a nutrient, nutrient, nutrients N1 and 2 and 3 can be administered in uh, pills okay and um, so there are three types of pills, okay, and the unit price um, of pill one, pill one, would be Y one. Well, and so forth. Y two and Y three. Okay. So let's say you have the cost for basically delivering this, or or, or, or uh, um, for each type of pill is y1, y2, y3. Okay. The question is to maximize revenue. So what will be the revenue be? Um, 24Y2 plus 32Y3. So you'd like to administer as few as possible of these pills and still maximize the minimum data requirement of, of that particular person. So each pill has one unit? Has one unit, right. So you have one unit uh, of of nutrients, right? So you're going to have the maximized revenue subject to uh, and now what are the constraints? Well, let's let's go back here. Well, the constraints is that you don't want to spend more than 120 for the first type of, of food. In other words, if if the person were ch would choose to go by the f with the, using the food intake rather than pill intake, then 
you would you wouldn't like to uh, exceed that cost of 120. So so y1 plus um, 2y2 plus 3y3 less than 120, and the other one is y1 plus 4y2 plus 6y3 less than 180. And of course, the y1, y2, y3 have to be positive. So I'd like to not to exceed those costs, right? On the other hand, you would like to maximize sort of the, um, the revenue by achieving the minimum requirement, data requirement. Okay? So that's exactly that, the way the dual is, is formulated. And you know, solving it is no, simplex method, either, either of the two, right? So after the break, we'll just talk about what's the relationship of the optimal solution of the primal problem versus the dual problem. And um, also, I think we have to talk a little bit about cases when, um, you know, regardless of primal or dual, what happens when you when your objective when excuse me when your variables can only take integer values? Okay. All right. So let's just take um, I don't know ten. Minutes.